Next up is Lance Trasky. Mr. Trasky, uh, please come forward. Nice to see you here. Welcome to the committee. Put yourself on the record once you're settled in and uh, uh, give us your testimony. Chairman French and members of the committee, uh, my name is Lance Trasky. I have 42 years of experience as a fisheries research biologist, a habitat biologist, and a regional supervisor with the Alaska Department of Fishing Game, uh, issuing habitat permits for projects like this. Establishing a restoration bond for the proposed Chewitna coal strip mine will be very difficult because there's nothing in the scientific literature or in the projects cited by PACRIM and the Alaska Department of, Fishing of Natural Resources, which supports the claims that recreation of a wild Pacific salmon stream and its associated drainage after strip mining has ever been successfully accomplished or is even feasible. It is also unlikely that the spawning channel and rearing ponds that PACRIM has offered as interim mitigation for the loss of salmon production from Chiritna River tributaries for 25 to 50 years would be successful in maintaining these stocks, which are likely genetically unique. The Chiritna River is known as the Kenai of the West Cook Inlet. Chiritna River supports substantial runs of all five species of Pacific salmon. It's an important contributor to the Cook Inlet commercial and subsistence fisheries. It is believed to be the major source of Chinook salmon to the Tionic subsistence fishery. And the Chiritna is the major Chinook salmon producing system on the west side of Cook Inlet and supports a sport fishery second only to the Deshka River. <clears throat> the Board of Fish has recently declared the Chiritna River stock a concern because of shortfalls in escapement and can the value of this fishery. In the first phase of mining, PACRIM has proposed to strip mine 8,000 acres of the three major Chiwitna salmon producing tributaries. Mining would re remove 11 miles of one tributary and all the surface and subsurface features down to a depth of approximately 300 feet. That's what the stream drainage would look like afterwards. PACRIM would have to, to, to redo this, they'd have to recreate this entire upper stream drainage from bedrock on up, from that hole in the ground dirt and build a stream on top of it. <clears throat> Recreation of both surface features such as wetlands and subsurface features such as the shallow and deep aquifers which provide critical groundwater to flow to these three major tributaries would be necessary because sockeye, chinook, and coho salmon select areas of upwelling groundwater for spawning and the input of ground, warm groundwater is essential to the overwinter survival of salmon legs and eggs and larvae in cold climates. The creation of a shallow aquifers would be one of the most critical elements in creation of a new salmon stream. Finally, an 11 mile long stable steam channel and repairing area incorporating all the complex and interconnecting structures and processes that allow salmon to successfully spawn and rear would have to be constructed on top of 300 feet of mine tailings. This has never been done and is likely not feasible. Both PACRIM and DNR have provided examples of projects which they claim support their contention the creation of a productive salmon stream after strip mining is feasible. I have reviewed these projects and have personal experience with most of the Alaskan projects cited. These projects do not support the contention that recreation of a new salmon spawning rearing stream is feasible. None of the examples provided by DNR or PACRIM involve complete removal of entire drainage with its associated salmon spawning streams, aquifers, wetlands, vegetation, and then the subsequent recreation of a new functioning salmon stream with all the essential elements on top of the fill. The objectives of most of these projects was actually to improve habitat in damaged fish streams with no expectations that salmon or other fish species would be restored to pre-development pre levels of productivity. Only three of the projects cited by DNR PACRIM even involved salmon streams and none of these streams were strip mined. Projects involving grayling or catfish have no relevance to the Chuetna because they have very different life histories and habitat requirements. <clears throat> None of the projects uh, that they cited e did mention restoring groundwater either, and, and I don't believe that any of them did. <clears throat> All of the Alaskan projects cited by uh, DNR and PACRIM as examples of the feasibility of restoring the Chuetna drainage after strip mining are small scale compared with a proposed Chewitna Coal Project, which includes 21,000 acres of leases and over 8,000 acres in the first phase of mining. In contrast, the Valdez Creek Mine, which was cited by DNR as an example of how a strip mined uh, stream could be restored, and, and this was the largest placer mine in Alaska. It was only 640 acres and only a mile of a grayling stream, not a salmon stream, was restored. State and federal biologists have also questioned the feasibility of salmon restoration. 
In a 2007 letter to the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Marine Fisheries Service concluded that Chewitna coal strip mine would cause permanent impacts to the Chewitna watershed and associated salmon habitat. NIMS stated, we are aware of no example of successful salmon stream restoration at this scale. In the Diamond Chewitna Coal Project Final Environmental Impact Statement, each EPA also included, it's questionable whether mine through streams could be restored to pre-mining productivity. Therefore, fish productivity could be a long-term loss. The Alaska Department of Fish and Game provided the following response to a letter from DNR asking whether reclamation of the Chewitna Coal Strip Mine was feasible. Fish and Game responded, while we are aware of small scale successes in reclaiming certain stream functions, we are not aware of any evidence documenting whether large scale reclamation of ecosystem function can or cannot be accomplished. In the process of reviewing all these Alaskan projects cited as ex examples of post successful post mining stream restoration by DNR and PACRIM, I asked a number of the fisheries biologists and hydrologists who were involved in developing these projects if they believe that these projects demonstrate that restoring thousands of acres of strip mine salmon streams, aquifers, and drainage was feasible. They all said no. They were also unaware of any examples of where a salmon producing drainage which had been removed by strip mining to depths of several hundred feet in a new stream created on top of the mine overburden actually occurred. PACRIM has proposed to construct a spawning channel and rearing ponds to replace salmon production from Chewitna tributaries lost to mining during the 25 to 50 years before a new stream could be created. DNR has cited salmon usage of Forest Service gravel pits adjacent to Granite Creek on the, creek on the Kenai Peninsula and two Canadian spawning channels as confirmation that these methods could replace lost salmon production. However, we do know that all the other Canadian spawning channels and all the spawning channels that have been constructed in Cook Inlet in the last 30 years, and there's been a number, have all failed over time. They have not worked. Mr. Tresky, want, uh, sp speak to that a little bit more. I'd I, I never heard of a spawning channel before. I take it it's an artificially it's, created. Well, yes. It's not as if you're stocking or stocking no, a stream. It, it, it's something different. Well, in, mo in some cases, there's a, they'll find a suitable place where there's upwelling groundwater. They'll dig a channel in a location near an existing spawning stream. And usually in Canada, what they've done, they've built these spawning channels because all the spawning habitat in these streams has been cemented, mostly due to logging in these drainages. So they can't spawn in the stream anymore, but they think there's still good rearing habitat. So they build a spawning channel. Which near, actually nearby. Nearby, right. and they pump in clean water, usually not from the stream that's got a lot of sediment, and through pipes and everything, and they, it'll upwell in the bottom of the stream trying to create natural channels. The fish will come in from, that, from the adjacent stream where they can't spawn anymore and spawn. A couple of them have worked, a lot of them haven't. But they've built 30 of them in Cook Inlet, I'm sorry, they've built a number of them, Cook Inlet Aquaculture over the years in Cook Inlet, and they've all failed over time. <coughs> That's interesting. And, and who was is, who is building them? Was it, was it Cook Inlet uh, Aquaculture. And they're, um, I guess I don't know who they are. Oh, they're the, prime, they're the, uh, I'm sorry, they're the Aquaculture Association for Cook Inlet that it takes money from fish taxes and stuff and uses it to ah, plant to build fish. habitat. Oh, yeah, the, the okay. Trail Creek Hatchery, okay. that sort of thing. Okay, they stock okay. silver okay. salmon that sport fishermen catch. Oh, sure, okay. So they're, and they're pretty good at what they do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but they haven't had success building... Um, spawning channels. Spawning channels. Yeah, in Cook Inlet. Right. So, uh, similarly, uh, they, and then they they also cite Forest Service gravel pits at Granite Creek that were connected to the creek and were used by juvenile salmon for rearing. And some of them have worked, but similarly, other gravel pits, such as the pit that Fish and Game and DOT tried to, con at Quartz Creek, just down the road from, you know, I'm sure you know where Quartz sure. Creek is. We sure. tried to convert that into a salmon spawning and rearing mm -hmm. system, and it failed miserably. In fact, it ended up killing a lot of salmon because of groundwater problems. Uh, we didn't get the kind of groundwater that we were supposed to, and parts of the stream dried up, so. Mm -hmm. But are you talking, Jared? <coughs> But Quartz so Creek near Cooper Landing? Yeah. There, there's, there's salmon in there. Oh, there's a lot of salmon in Quartz Creek, but where there isn't salmon is in that gravel pit that DOT built to expand that road. We tried to convert that into a, spanning ro a salmon spawning and rearing pond, just like they're talking about doing here at Chewitna. That one failed. Hey, can I, do, I mean, why did they fail? What, do, what's... What that one failed because... They fail for all kinds of reasons, and I'll tell you the, the biggest reason at all in just a minute. But they fail primarily because you're not getting enough groundwater in there. If you don't get groundwater in there all the time, you know, all seasons of the year, in the winter they freeze out and go anoxic, or in the summer 
the outlet stream dries up and the fish can't get in or out. So they fail for lots of reasons. Interesting. Uh, <coughs> Can I just ask? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, they fail. Most importantly, the presence of invasive northern pike in the Chewitna drainage. In sorry, Mr. Tresky, hold on one second. Yeah, I'm sorry. Senator has one yeah, more question. I'm sorry. Yeah. So are you aware of any salmon streams that have been um, removed or destroyed that have been anywhere in the world that have been successfully rehabilitated? Not on this scale. I mean, we've done small scale. In fact, my region, actually, if you're familiar with the Kenai River and stuff, we are the people that really brought fish habitat restoration into Alaska. All the bank work. On the, Kenai the River, the yeah. Walkways, we miles the shading, oh, yep. the netting. Yep. It's extremely well done, but yep. it's expensive. Yeah, well, and it's small, but it's small scale. We're just fixing a bank. We're not removing the right. whole Kenai River right. drainage down to 300 feet dumping the remaining dirt back in and building the Kenai River on top of it. I, I have sort of, I mean, I'm glad you brought this up. It, it's occurred to me um, what this hearing room would look like and what this building would look like if this idea were being proposed on the Kenai River. Um, you know, it, it would be mass um, you'd public have to have insurrection. The there would be public have the, insurrection. You'd right? have to have the troopers here. Right, right. Can Senator I get a sense, do you, um, How big of a river are we talking about here? <laughs> okay. Have you, have you been over there? It's about the size of China for Senator mm -hmm. Coghill, and uh, the Chewitna is. And uh, I'm uh, bigger than Deep Creek, you know, and then in Elchick, bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And the tri one tributary we're talking about is like Campbell Creek. Mm -hmm. Okay, pretty good. Or maybe Ship Creek, about, okay. about that size. Yeah, yeah that's, that helps put it in context. Oh, anyways, because of the presence of invasive North Pike and the Chewitna drainage, any attempt to sand. Uh, sustain salmon production by spawning channels and rearing ponds is unlikely to succeed. Salmon thrive in these low gradient environments and have extirpated salmon and trout from all the lakes, gravel pits, Cheney Lake in Anchorage, you're probably familiar with that, and slow moving streams throughout South Central Alaska. It's unfortunate they're in there. They don't, they can't use the rest of the system. It's too high gradient. They don't, the existing system will work. They can't, they, the, the, these rearing ponds and stuff are perfect habitat and the, you won't raise salmon in those ponds. So anyways, is there, uh, Senator, is, yep. is there northern pike in that region? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. There's and unfortunately, and, and they, in the MacArthur, I'm sorry, uh, Theodore Creek, they've wiped all the salmon out of Theodore Creek. That was a terrific producing stream. But the, unfortunately, the best salmon rearing streams, particularly for silvers, are these low swampy type of streams with lots of wetlands because they're very productive and silvers really grow in there. But that's what pike like. And unfortunately, we have them now. And we're trying to figure out how to get rid of so them. So why aren't the pike decimating this area now? The problem is, is that most of that stream, except for the lower part of it, is pretty high gradient. And pike like Gradient meaning fast? Uh, a lot of slope, fast water, you know, rapids, pools, you know. They don't like that kind of I stuff. Like they don't lose the lakes. Oh, yes, yeah. If you fish for pike, you know where they are. And are you saying that you couldn't, they, this couldn't be restored in a way to keep it high gradient? No, I'm saying you can't sustain the runs by building spawning channels and gravel pits, which are essentially little ponds, and low gradient spawning channels, because the pike will just go in there and eat whatever you produce. Mm -hmm. Now, they won't eat, and they haven't eaten the salmon that are produced in these high gradient tributaries. So, please proceed. In conclusion, I have not found any independent restoration experts in Alaska or elsewhere, including all the people I work with. Scientific studies or projects cited by DNR and PACRIM that support the contention that reconstruction of a salmon stream with its whole drainage, and we're not talking just about a stream channel, we're talking about the whole drainage, the hills, the vegetables, the wetland, everything. Um, the reconstruction of a salmon stream on top, and it's confined and unconfined aquifers, wetlands, and other essential elements on top of 300 feet of mine overburden is feasible. Restoration of a strip mine salmon producing drainage would be exponentially more difficult than small scale projects to route a stream around a man made barrier, revegetate stream banks like on the Kenai, or attempt to confine an unstable placer mine stream to a single channel. In considering standards for bonding mines such as Chewitna, legislature should keep in mind that all of the techniques cited by DNR and PACRIM as examples of the feasibility of recreating salmon stream drainages were developed in the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia in an attempt to halt or reverse the continuing decline of valuable and animus fish salmon populations due to habitat loss. Billions of dollars have been spent in the U.S. and Canada with little or no success. 
If the project cited by Pacrium and DNR is proof of the feasibility of recreating a salmon stream work, these methods would be used everywhere and salmon populations would be increasing, not declining everywhere. The problem is that from a salmon habitat perspective, the effect of permanent landscape changes, such as the deep strip mining proposed for the Chuitna River drainage, probably can't be reversed. Currently, DNR has considerable discretion in setting bonds amounts. It is important to recognize if the state allows strip mining through a wild salmon stream at Chewitna, it will set pace, set pace state policy that will endure. So in light of the fact that there's nothing to indicate that restoration of strip mine salmon drainages to pre-mining functions and values, or that artificial maintenance of genetically unique runs is feasible, the legislature should take a hard look at whether mining through salmon streams is a precedent the state should pursue. If so, there will need to be some very difficult discussions about how to put a value on the loss of a renewable resource, wild salmon, in perpetuity. So thank you. Senator Coghill has a question. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> uh, Mr. Trasky, thanks for all of the work you've done down through the years. So uh, oh, I greatly appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to work for the state. Help me understand the context of this. This. Uh, and I appreciate you put it in the context of the size of the Chena River. That helps me mentally yep. get a picture. Uh, so you're going up into this mining area. There's uh, probably three or four tributaries. And then, but you, you go further downstream, and when you start counting tributaries that go out, it looks like, like 10 or 15. So help me understand the context of the salmon I, spawning ranges in that area. Well, there's, there's, there's tributaries to this. Uh, some of them were low gradient and they have pike in them and then we're big salmon producers anyways. I think these three, three streams that they're gonna be impacted by mining and another one that may be impacted in later phases uh, produce almost all the salmon oh, in that range, right? yeah. Because I noticed there's some on the northern side and some on kind of the south uh, western side that uh, are main channels that uh, are on yeah. the Tionic River. Yeah. Uh, oh, you mean on the? the um, yeah, 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 I know what you uh, mean. In that area that are, they're not as productive, this is the main production? I think that's, that's it. We don't have information, you know, on that, on all that because the state, frankly, hasn't the money to, to study all these things outside of what was mine. But, from my experience over the years and, and in talking to the biologists and stuff, these seem to be the major producers of yeah. the sockeye, coho, kings, it's a, it's a big king salmon producing stream, uh, and yeah. silvers. Yeah. And just for me, it, you know, if it's up to us to start setting bonding limits, it would be nice for us to know what the context is. Yeah, well, absolutely. And so uh, uh, that may be something that uh, I'll drill down into further. Well, the other thing to consider is because these, the, as I say, these shallow aquifers are essential to s producing salmon in Alaska. You cannot produce salmon here without having that flow of warm groundwater into those streams in the winter. You could have a grayling stream that freezes to the bottom in the winter, and they all do, but that doesn't hurt because the grayling all leave in the winter. They all head out and get into deep water. So, you know, uh, yeah, not only is that groundwater coming in there, but the deeper aquifers that are going to be destroyed, and you can see there's a number of them, actually are maybe feeding parts of the Chewitna <coughs> a considerable distance downstream. And in fact, this water may actually go as far as over as uh, Beluga, you know, when people, because mm -hmm. there's artesian wells over there. so. We don't know the full impact of how inter uh, disrupting all that groundwater is going to affect this whole system, but we know that, no that it's critical because the salmon, eggs, and fry are there all winter. They have to be there, and they, have to st they can't freeze out. They have to be there. That you've got to have that shallow groundwater in there, and nobody's ever produced it. And I've looked for, I've looked for about 10 years. Mr. Chairman, just one other question. This is more curiosity, I think. Are these enhanced at all? in any of these? No, no. The, all the enhanced streams in, in that are, of course, uh, Ship Creek, uh, and then some down, I think, the um, Nadelchik maybe, and of course, the Cook Island aquaculture uh, does stock, you know, silvers for both commercial fishermen and sport fishermen, Seward, and other places. No, they're it not. It just seemed to me, Mr. Chairman, that if they were enhanced, they probably would have a little more study base to them. That's <coughs> it's possible. Yeah. Well, we're, we're going to have to I'm move sorry. on. Yeah, that's Thank that's quite okay. A fascinating witness, a great uh, body of information there. I appreciate your uh, oh. making yourselves available to us in person today. Thank uh, you. Very helpful. Opportunity.